Hi everybody, thank you for coming to my channel. Let us listen together introduction. Um, I, I read something over here beautifully, you know, and I'd like to share with you. It's one of my uh, news, uh, newspaper, uh, Christian newspaper. And they are talking about God's superlatives, okay? So, right there, I wrote it down in the scriptures. And let me read it to you, because I think it's an uplifting, okay? The, super, the uh, superlatives of Scripture suggest thought that transcends all human speech. Men's uh, super, superlatives are often signs of weakness, carelessness, and excitement. God's uh, superlatives carry men's thoughts up to the brink, beyond which is the infinite. They show the poverty of earthly speech and the riches of heavenly thoughts. Let us consider a few examples. His unspeakable gift, and you can read it in 2 Corinthians 9.15. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. God's gift of Christ to us is called unspeakable. The greatness of God's gift to us in Christ is inexpressible, too wonderful for words. The greatest of God's gift is indescribable because with Him we have all other treasures and all needs supplied. You can read it in Romans 8, 32 and Philippians 4, 19. Human language fails to portray more than the fringe of his robes, the beginning of his power, the touch of his highness, the unspeakable, unspeakablenessness of his love is expressed in the title word, so, of John 3.16, for God so loved, and you know the whole thing, that He gave His only begotten Son, right? So here is the expression, okay, of His richness. You can read it also in Ephesians 2.7, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Here we see another superlative uh, used in portraying God's grace. God's grace is unmeasurable, limitedness, uh, surpassing and incalculable. The, lux uh, the luxurance of God's grace is to be experienced now. Okay, there is no trial or circumstance but that the glorious riches of His resources of grace is sufficient for us. Every circumstance may be used as an instrument of discovery, and every day we may advance more deep into the highest of the higher uh, latitude of the wonderful grace of God. This tremendous, generously uh, of the grace of God goes on and on unto the eternal ages. <clears throat> there are hidden wonders in the untrodden realms of divine grace. Eternally <clears throat> will be filled with the exploration and discovery of the glorious riches of His resources in the incalculable riches of Christ. You cannot even calculate it. Can you imagine that? His exceeding abundance. Here's another thing, and you can read it in Ephesians 3.20. Uh, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Very important point. I, get an, I will continue with that, but that, okay? This uh, uh, superlative uh, relates to prayer. That is carry of uh, exaltation, a true song of triumph, 
it tells us that God's giving is super abundant, infinitely more than we ever dare to ask or imagine. God's bounty goes infinitely beyond our highest prayer, desires, thoughts, hope, and dreams. God's giving surpassing immeasurably our thoughts and asking, but there must be the asking and the thinking for it to surpass. He always puts more and better things into our hands than we expected, when the expectant hand is reached out to him. We should always remember that what seems impossible to us is easy for divine omnipotence and almightiness, his far more exceeding glory. You can read it in 2 Corinthians 4:17. For our light, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us at far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It's hard to comprehend, you know, what he's saying over here to me, because we have a finite mind, okay? Uh, in a comforting contrast, affliction is placed over against glory. The contrast is between present tribulation and future compensations. The afflictions are light, and they are but for a moment. The glory is tremendous and eternal. Wow. You can hardly wait, folks. It is beyond all measure. It ex excessively surpasses all comparison and calculation. It is a fast and transcendent glory and blessedness which shall never cease. This glory towards is out of uh, proportion in our pains. His glory that excels. You can read it also in uh, 2 Corinthians 3.10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this present, in this respect, by reason of the glory that excellent. Something a little hard to understand that, but uh, we'll continue. The reference is to Moses and the law and the glory which attended is given. The giving of the law was glorious, but it uh, minister condemnation and death. The gospel has, far, has a far brighter glory, for it ministers righteousness. Wow, that's the difference, okay? Now look over here. So the former glory is completely eclipsed by a far brighter glory as the moon and stars fade in the presence of the sun. The first glory as shown in Moses' face is worth nothing at all in comparison with Christ's overwhelming glory. These uh, sublime climaxes that suggest the unspeakable and defy description lead from one level of thought to a higher level preparing us for glory when we shall see face to face. In the beautiful, I think we have a glorious uh, future as a Christian. But in the same token, we have to understand what it's all about, I mean, we are, you know, what is the requir requir requirement, excuse me. And I believe it's, on the, it's, uh, it's important to understand when God gave his word to us, how we act upon it. And I think, uh, let's show, I wrote it on the board, okay, and I, a long time ago I shared this particular, this particular topic already. It's a very short one, but it's very profound. How can we apply or, or understand this? And I'm talking about the fullness of the Spirit. When you're a Christian, okay, the Holy Spirit is in you. So, Let's see what this has to say with about in Ephesians 5:18. There are four grammatical rules 
in the Greek language would lead us to four truths relative to this great subject. The words in Ephesians 5.18 are, Be filled with the Spirit. First, the verb is in the imperative mode. That is, it is imperative that we be filled with the Spirit. First, because God command, commands it. Second, because the fullness of the Spirit is the divine enablement in the life of a Christian, which results in a Christ-like life. Failure to be filled with the Spirit is sin, and results in failure to live a life honoring to God. Very profound, isn't it? Second, the tense of the verb is present, and this tense is the imperative mode always represent action going on. We learn from this that the mechanics of the spirit-filled uh, life do not okay, provide for a spasmodic filling. That is, the Christian is not filled only when doing service, such as preaching or teaching. But the Christian living a normal life of moment by moment yieldness to God experiences a moment by moment fullness of the Spirit. No Christian can do with less and at the same time live a victorious life. Third, the verb is in the plural number, which teaches us that this command is addressed not only to the preacher and the deacon and the teacher in Sunday school, but to every Christian, to the businessman, the laborer, the housewife. It is the responsibility of every Christian to be always filled with the Holy Spirit. Fourth, the verb is in the passive voice. This grammatical uh, classification represents the subject of a verb as inactive but being acted upon. This teaches us that the filling with the Spirit is not a work of man but of God. We cannot work ourselves up to the condition by any amount of tearing, praying, or Agonizing, a simple desire for that fullness and a trust in the Lord Jesus for that fullness will result in that fullness. And you can read it also in the story of John in John 7, 37 through 9, when Christ yelled to the people, If anyone thirsts, come and drink freely. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. You can read it for yourself more in detail. Okay? But what does it mean by the fullness of the Spirit? The fullness of the Holy Spirit, excuse me. We find the answer in James 4 5. Do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit that dwells in us lusteth to envy? Lusteth to envy the Holy Spirit? The word lust is an absolute uh, English word meaning to earnestly desire. The translation reads, the Spirit who has taken up His permanent abode in us constantly and earnestly desire to the point of envy. Have you ever heard that? Now, what does He desire even to the point of a divine envy. In Galatians 5.17 we read, For the flesh has a strong desire to suppress the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit has a strong desire to suppress the flesh. And these are firmly settled in an attitude of opposition. The 
one another to one another depth you may not do the things which you constantly desire to do. The constant desire of the following nature is to sin. The Holy Spirit is the divine provision against sin in the life of a Christian. The evil nature wishes to use the faculties of the believer for sinful purposes. The Holy Spirit desire to us to use them, excuse me, to use them for God's glory. The choice is with the Christian. He chooses which of the two will control his faculties. Thus, the passage in James read in paraphrase. The Spirit who has taken up his final abode in us, jealousy desires the whole of us, yieldedness to and dependence upon the Holy Spirit result in the Spirit putting down the evil nature in the feet and producing in the believer a life pleasing to God. Thus, the fullness of the Spirit refers to His control over the believer. The translation in our text is, Be ye being constantly filled with the Spirit. I hope this little thing will encourage you. And like I said before, it's, un it's, you know, it's impossible to please God, okay? If you don't have, of course, the beautiful part, of course, is the uh, is, is the, the thing that we, uh, as believers, okay, allow the Holy Spirit to get control over us. So I hope, and I, I will, I'll, uh, this will be a little short one, like I said before, but the whole point I'm trying to say is this, God help us if we allow it. But first of all, you have to become, what is called, a, a Christian, and a Christian is a born-again believer, okay? And uh, i like to go next time, okay, as over here. Oh, let me tell you something real quick, uh, if I, I, okay. The needle's eye. I, I read this and I didn't understand, okay, remember? The rich young lord loved his riches, you know, talk about the man, so much that they kept him from accepting eternal life from the Son of God. In speaking of the impossibility of such uh, entering the kingdom of God, Jesus used the illustration of the impossibility of a camel going through the eye of the needle. Some have thought that the needle's eye refers to a gate in the wall of Jerusalem through which by means of much pulling and pushing a camel could finally be taken. The Greek of Matthew in Matthew 19.24 and Mark 10.25 speaks of a needle that is used with thread and Luke 18.25 uses the medical term for the needle used in surgical operation. It is evident that the gate is not meant but tiny eyes of a sewing needle. Sewing needle. This was probably a current uh, proverb for the impossible. Uh, the Talmud twice speaks of an elephant passing through the eye of the needle as being impossible. It is therefore impossible for anyone whose love for wealth keep him from trusting Jesus Christ as Savior to be saved. In answer to the disciples' question, who then can be saved? Jesus says, the things that are impossible for man are possible by God or with God. The word with in the Greek means literally beside. Take your stand beside man on the question of riches and it is impossible to be saved. But take your stand beside God on the matter and the formerly impossible becomes possible. I stop right now and like I said I, I give you something to think about 
and I hope the scriptures I give you and the story over here about the needle eye, you know, is so important and so profound that, like it says again, what is impossible for us, everything is possible with God. And we only can do that through the love of God if we want to accept His love. And I mean, of course, and that means uh, to be born again, you know, by God's Spirit and receive Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And I always keep pressing on to, 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 to you, time is short. We don't know what happened tomorrow, what can happen tomorrow. We can die tomorrow. The question is always like this, are you prepared? Are you ready to meet your Maker? There's only two ways to go, folks, heaven or hell. And especially, I always go back to that, read Revelation 21.8. Tell you certain things over there, to, you know, of people, and I will go more about it in detail, step by step. It is so important to know who you believe in. Now remember now, there's only one God. Okay? You can read it in Isaiah 43, 44, and 45. We've got all com, uh, continuous say, say one thing. I'm God, there is no God before me no God after me. So, I would say, if you could anything out of my video, please give me the thumb up. If you like to subscribe, please ring the notification bell. And I will say then, until next time, God bless you. Bye-bye now.